Hey, what's up, guys? MKBHD here, and this is the new, the newest 2020 cheese grater Mac Pro. There's a lot of things that I could say about this from the couple months that I've been using it, but mainly they boil down to three main things. One, it's extremely well made to the point of like over engineered almost. Two, it's modular, finally. And three, it's really fast. Now my typical review video for a piece of tech that's really good ends with something like, it's really good, you should buy it. But with this, even though it's quite good, it's more along the lines of, you probably shouldn't buy it. Most people will never need this, but I'm really glad they made it. So this of course is the newest, highest end Mac ever made. And the Mac's price that you can pay for it also makes it the most expensive Mac ever made. And you might remember everyone had a good time with their headlines with that. But it's more than just that. It's the highest end and most modular tower computer Apple's made in years. And that's something that people like me were waiting very patiently a very long time for. So everything about the design of the Mac Pro, and I mean everything from the inside out, is really well done, but like to the point of over-engineered. Like it's, it's unnecessary. It's the most over-engineered desktop tower I've ever seen. And most of this over-engineering is in the name of aesthetics, and noise. So you might remember Apple sort of showed the world how much they really care about aesthetics and noise when they tried to make the last Mac Pro a tiny cylinder on your desk cooled entirely by one big fan at the top. But that didn't go so well. So while they are now finally back to making the modular tower form factor that we were waiting for, that did not stop them from making possibly the cleanest, quietest desktop computer possible. Like the cheese grater design with the holes up front and the mesh piece behind it, it is weird looking to the point where it's like unmistakable, you know, kind of like some other Apple products this year, but it's also an airflow design as much as anything. You see, the entire Mac Pro, when you take the shell off and look inside, is designed to be passively air-cooled. Uh, there isn't much of fans on any of the internal components. There's no liquid cooling. There's just three huge blowers at the front, one here back near the rear, and a bunch of heat pipes on everything. So the entire chassis is designed to pass as much airflow through the system as possible to cool everything. But airflow is not quiet, and even you know fans like these are not typically quiet by themselves. And if you have all three fans like this spinning at the same rate, they sort of amplify each other and make this whine that you'll probably hear. Now a lot of PCs do this, and this is fine, but Apple decided to make this computer quieter. They'd spin each of the fans at a slightly different rate so that they wouldn't all match. But even when you do that, you sometimes end up with harmonics that sort of amplify some of the sounds and still make it audible. So Apple's fan controller literally modulates the speed of each one of these fans and ramps them up and down so that they never match and are never steady so that you never hear it and it works. Another thing you might notice when the system is open is, well, number one, you can't open the Mac Pro unless you unplug everything from the back, including power, which is kind of annoying, but I guess not a huge deal. Anyway, you get it open and you don't see any cables. There is not one single exposed cable anywhere in the Mac Pro as you get it from Apple. Now there's headers to plug stuff in if you want, but all the first party stuff just plugs right in with strategically placed pins. So in Apple's ideal world, everything everyone makes is compatible as MPX modules and they just slide in just like theirs, keeping the world clean, matte black, and easily modular. The only tool you need to do most of the adjustments inside is a single Phillips head screwdriver. And then to take stuff out, you unlock this big sliding full height PCI slot lock. That they didn't have to do, but they did, and it's sweet. And they labeled everything, so if you don't know exactly what you're doing, they've numbered the parts in the order that you should remove them to have everything slide in and out easily. So one is the thumb screws on the side. Don't need a screwdriver for those. You can just literally unscrew them to take off the bracket. Two is the bridge between the modules. So if you have more than one, this just needs one screw. You just pop it straight off. Three is the screws on the other side. And you can see they're still connected to the bracket with a spring, so they're not loose screws. So you can't lose them without losing the whole bracket. And you get that off, and then the last step is the very satisfying lever to pull out of the PCI slot, and then your MPX module is free. Now these MPX modules inside also have no fans in them, which means they're passively air-cooled and they rely very heavily on the airflow going through those front three fans and the heat sinks, and that has its pros and cons. The pro being, no extra fans means no extra noise, but they also tend to be thicker than most normal parts because the huge heat sinks are bigger than just putting in more fans. I mean, look at the size of this GPU versus a typical high-end graphics card. But hey, that's what they've built it around. 
and they've even labeled the underside of the RAM cover for instructions on where to seat your memory depending on how many sticks you have so you can take best advantage of this multi-channel memory we're working with here. A lot of this stuff they just straight up didn't have to do. So they've clearly paid a lot of attention to fit and finish. So how about performance? Because that's why you get a computer like this at the core. And for me, it's been excellent. Noticeably better for me even than the maxed out 18 core $12,000 iMac Pro that I came from before I was using this. Now here are my Mac Pro's specs of the machine that I've been editing on these last few videos you've been watching were made with. And if you check through those options on Apple's site, you will see that I've given Apple north of 40,000 of my own dollars for a computer. So yeah, Christ, it should perform a lot better than any iMac or any all-in-one ever. Now again, most people will never need parts like this. Uh, I am a Final Cut Pro editor. That's my pro level workflow. That's why I need the speed and power of these pieces. And for that, it has been incredible, as I've noted with workflow examples in the past. And I think animators, maybe high-end photographers can take advantage of the power of the Mac Pro, but if most people watching this, you know, video makers, YouTubers even, if it's not 4K, you don't even need a base Mac Pro. So just know that. We have a couple other Mac Pros in the studio, and the one that I'm using, those are my specs, but we've tested a bunch of different ones. I won't bore you with the benchmarks. If you want a proper benchmark-filled video with comparisons, I will link Linus Tech Tips, his video. He did a great job, and you should check that out for his Mac Pro review. This thing is clearly powerful. It is definitely not more than I can ever use, though. It's not invincible. For all intents and purposes, I have a maxed out Mac Pro, aside from the 768 gigs of RAM, um, which could be doubled, but essentially this is the best computer Apple's ever made. Uh, and you can still watch it crawl to a halt. All you gotta do is shoot an 8K red clip at a low compression ratio, maybe something like five to one, then import it onto any large timeline, 4K or 8K, suit yourself, set playback to high quality, press play, and then observe as the Mac Pro slowly starts to choke, drop frames, and become unusable. You can imagine though how like a MacBook Pro or an iMac or iMac Pro would have handled that even worse. But I wanna talk about that afterburner card for a minute though because that to me is really interesting. So Apple made a $2,000 PCI decoder card that essentially just decodes ProRes and ProRes RAW. So photographers don't need it at all. Coders, anyone making apps, developing, don't need it. Even if you edit in any other codec other than ProRes or ProRes RAW, you will not benefit at all from an afterburner card. But if you do edit ProRes, it will decode those streams and let you effortlessly play back tons of high-res video streams. I think they've said up to 23 consecutive streams of 4K or six 8K videos at the same time while it's basically taking that load off of the CPU. But I don't edit. ProRes, I edit Red Code Raw, so why did I get an afterburner card? Well, this afterburner card built around FPGA is reprogrammable, meaning Apple and Red can work together to enable this afterburner to accelerate Red Code playback. And rumor is this is something that's already in the works. Uh, now, I don't have any proof on my end or any updates that show that that integration has come to fruition yet, but the potential is definitely there for even bigger video games. And that potential exists for other codecs too, Canon Raw, Ari Raw, whatever other stuff you might be shooting that's not ProRes yet, that may eventually be optimized for the metal and give you huge performance. So maybe someday in the future, I will be able to play back five to one 8K red code and it'll just seamlessly butter through it at high quality. So overall, to wrap up the Mac Pro, let me put it this way. It's not just that the Mac Pro is a really expensive computer. It's more that Apple chose to make a very, very expensive machine in the Mac Pro. Does that make sense? Like tons and tons of the choices they've made in this computer would not be found or even noticed in many other desktop computers. The completely cableless interior of the system, pretty sweet, but totally unnecessary. The crazy fan control, the, the PCI lock that's really satisfying, the system for the MPX modules, the fact that every button in this Mac Pro is made of metal instead of plastic and there's pins for them, every single little thing is carefully considered and taken to the max. So those other desktop computers are for most people, which is nice, but Apple decided to make the computer that took no shortcuts and took it to the max with premium things like build quality and, and performance. So I'm happy they did that because I'm in the very, very, 
small sliver of the demographic where that's exactly what I'm looking for. The downside is Apple just straight up doesn't make a thousand dollar modular desktop tower. Like that's not a downside of the Mac Pro, that's a downside of Apple. That's just a product they don't make. There's a ton of products I wish Apple would make that they just straight up don't. I wish they would make like a mirrorless camera because they already make some of the best smartphone cameras out there, but they just don't make a camera. Desktop speakers, computer speakers, they don't make that. A multi-device wireless charger, <laughs> they don't make that either. So add that to the list, uh, like $900 to $1,200 tower that's modular, Apple just doesn't make that either. But they do make this, a silent killer, and I am really happy with it, and I'm really looking forward to it lasting me hopefully a decade and getting better over time. So that's been it. Thanks for watching. Catch you guys in the next one. Peace. Also, Apple, the, the $400 wheels, they're great, but uh, they, they really need locks.